talking about um, fluid, res fluid responsiveness and predicting fluid responsiveness. Um, there's a lot of recent literature on this, uh, and we're not going to cover all of it. Uh, my goals are to kind of provide some kind of physiologic background, uh, and then some statistical, a little bit of statistical stuff that'll help you kind of interpret the literature that's out there, and then briefly review the, the evidence behind some of the different techniques that we already are using. So, as kind of a uh, to frame to frame the question, imagine a patient, a uh, guy in the emergency department who's coming in with pneumonia. It's hospital day zero. Um, he's got heart failure and he's currently septic, but he looks pretty good, doesn't he? Uh, <laughs> imagine him five days later. Things have not gone well. He's still intubated. He's still on pressors. He's 10 liters positive. Um, and in both, in both situations, you're faced with this question of, you know, suppose that first guy, his heart rate's 115, and he's, his blood pressure's a little soft, and he's got a lactate of 4. And then, similar situation here, he's still on pressors, he still has a lactate. In both of these situations, you're faced with the question of whether giving fluids is going to uh, improve the patient's hemodynamics, essentially. Um, so I want to specifically talk about you know, what, what is our goal in giving fluids? And then um, we're going to go over some of this other stuff. We'll talk about how do we define fluid responsiveness? Why can't we just use the CVP? Um, a brief foray into uh, explaining some of the stats and some of these studies. Uh, and then really kind of the, the, meat of the, talk is, the meat of the talk is going to be emphasizing the underlying physiology so that you can... Um, kind of apply that to your interpretation of whether or not a test is going to be useful for your patient. Uh, then specifically we'll talk about some of the existing static indices and dynamic indices uh, for predicting fluid responsiveness. So why do we give fluids? Um, whether or not a patient is dry or whether or not they're fluid responsive, those questions in and of themselves, uh, if, even if the answer is yes to both those questions, doesn't necessarily need, mean the patient needs fluids. Uh, kind of by definition, fluid responsiveness, by, by the definition of fluid responsiveness, every healthy euvolemic patient would respond to fluids. So just because a patient is fluid responsive doesn't mean they need fluids. So we give fluids to improve the hemodynamics in somebody who's hemodynamically uh, compromised, somebody who is underperfusing. The idea being that by administering fluids, you'll improve venous return, thus stroke volume and cardiac output. Um, so this kind of assumes that the patient is on the ascending portion of the Frank Starling curve. Uh, if they're not, or they're not fluid responsive, then you're not going to improve their stroke volume, you're not going to improve their hemodynamics. Um, so the trick is kind of identifying those patients. Uh, there's a lot of uh, literature out there on this question. About half of ICU patients will fall into that category. Um, so the the practice of giving a, a fluid challenge and figuring it out afterwards is going to have deleterious effects in half your patients. So those non-responders, those ones that we hope to weed out with the test that we're going to discuss in a moment, um, experience all the adverse effects of fluids without any of the hemodynamic benefits. So, you know, under resisting fluids, uh, excuse me, under resisting patients is bad, uh, but there's a growing body of literature that you're probably pretty well acquainted with showing that fluid overload is also bad. So, for instance, there's a retrospective analysis of uh, patients in the ARDSNET database where um, essentially patients who were net negative on day four had half the mortality of patients who were net positive on day four. So whether or not you can attribute that entirely to if they were given too much fluids or if there was something else that... Um, you know, there, uh, there are a lot of reasons why a patient would end up net negative or net positive, apart from the decisions about fluid responsiveness and the administrations of, uh, administration of fluids based on those. Um, but it's not the only piece of data, and I'm sure you guys are all well aware that fluid overload isn't good. So identifying patients that are going to benefit from fluids, um, the definition that's commonly used is an increase in stroke volume of 10, usually 15%, after a small bolus. Picking these patients on the basis of physical exam, as you guys probably know, does not really work. Um, I don't have a specific study for this one, but there's a lot out there. Uh, 
showing that looking at um, skin turgor and mucous membranes and all the stuff that we do every day doesn't accurately predict which patients are going to respond to fluids. And you might not be surprised, um, people still do it. I mean, we all, it's part of the physical exam. Similarly, people still use CVP. Um, and maybe it doesn't sound so bad, 64% of intensivists rely on CVP to guide resuscitation. But uh, some of the data that I'm about to present would suggest that this is, um, well, CVP is even worse than I thought. Um, and the numbers here, the 64%, this survey found in other specialties, the number's a lot higher. So there's a big problem. So why can't we just use CVP? Well, for one, uh, most of the research out there shows that CVP is 8 to 12, both in people who are going to benefit from a fluid bolus and in people who don't benefit from a fluid bolus. Um, and that's in large part because fluid responsiveness is a small part of the determinant of CVP. Um, all these other things, stuff that's intuitive, stuff that increases right heart pressures, pulmonary hypertension, right uh, RV hypertrophy, high P pressures or high intra-abdominal pressures, um, obviously uh, uh, constrictive pericarditis or something pressing on the heart, all these things are going to increase your, your central venous pressure without necessarily, um, you know, and that increase is independent of whether or not the patient would still improve their cardiac output in, re in response to additional fluids. Um, so we use CVP as a surrogate for right atrial pressure and eventually the idea being that that's a surrogate for left ventricular preload um, and that um, and we, we say if that's low then they probably need some more fluids and they would improve their cardiac output with, uh, with additional fluid. But it's, it's not actually an assessment of volume responsiveness. It's not actually, I don't think even if there were an advocate of CVP, they wouldn't make the claim that it's an index of whether or not the patient's going to benefit from additional fluids. It's kind of how full the tank is, not whether the patient needs more. And I'm going to present now that it's not even really how full, how full the tank is. CVP represents part of your venous volume. And to really explain this, um, I want to introduce a couple of concepts. One is the mean circulatory filling pressure. The other is the concept of stressed versus unstressed venous volume. Um, so we might get a little bit into the weeds here, but uh, the big takeaway from all the physiology stuff is already on the slide. That as we discussed, when you give fluids, the idea is you want to improve preload and uh, improve cardiac output. Um, but preload, venous return, is determined by this, this formula. Mean circulatory filling pressure minus CVP divided by the resistance in the venous system, which makes sense. It's kind of the driving pressure divided by the resistance. But you'll notice CVP is on the wrong side of the equation here. It makes sense, you know, the CVP is essentially the pressure in the right atrium, which is the pressure that returning blood pushes against. So uh, this is kind of confusing. And to understand it, you got to understand this stressed versus unstressed venous, uh, uh, venous volume. The gist of it is veins are really distensible. They're highly compliant. You can put a bunch of fluid into them before they, there's any transmural wall pressure in the venous system. You keep pouring fluid in uh, up to a certain point, and then they kind of expand to the point where they're not going to expand without exerting some pressure back. So as you're pouring fluid in, up to that point where there's a, a, the veins are exerting some transmural pressure, that's the unstressed volume. After that, that's the stressed volume. So there's some other stuff that can affect venous compliance besides just how much fluid's in there, and that will, that will affect stressed volume but not unstressed volume. Now, the only reason I introduce these kind of boring, kind of esoteric <coughs> concepts is because CVP represents unstressed volume, and the stressed volume is what determines your mean circulatory filling pressure. It's the difference between those two that determines your venous return. Um, so, I gotta be honest, looking around the room, I don't think, uh, <laughs> don't think you want me to uh, dal uh, delay anymore on this slide and explain these diagrams, but this is a good paper, this Gelman one. Um, I guess essentially you can imagine uh, well, I'm just going to skip it, to be honest. I think we'll get to the stuff you're more interested in. Um, a more familiar uh, 
figure depicting fluid responsiveness, Frank Starling curve. What we want to do is identify patients that are on the steep part of the Frank Starling curve. So people have different curves based on their, um, their contractility uh, and their afterload. But uh, you don't know which curve your patient has. You don't know what point they are on that curve. And CVP doesn't give you any information about either of those questions. <coughs> By the same token, well, we'll get to this in a minute. By the same token, wedge pressure doesn't either. So with that physiologic background for why CVP would not necessarily be a predictor of volume responsiveness, it's perhaps unsurprising that uh, there's a lot of data that it doesn't predict um, volume responsiveness. Um, so there's a meta-analysis in 2013 where you have this area under the curve for the, the CVP as a test of volume responsiveness of 0.56. Uh, a similar meta-analysis in 2016 where they included subgroups of people with low CVP and intermediate CVP and high CVP. They found even among those patients with low CVP, the area under the curve was still 0.57. Um, and we're going to have to explain, I'm going to have to go into yet another concept that's sort of only tangentially related to fluid responsiveness, but I think not just in the uh, studies I'm going to present today, but when you guys go to the literature and, and get some more, this concept of area under the curve is going to be valuable. So I want to talk about that in just a sec. Um, basically, you can't have an area under the curve of less than 50%. That's chance. So the fact that these are pretty darn close to 50% shows CVP is basically a coin flip as far as predicting fluid responsiveness. So what is area under the curve? I'm only explaining this because it's going to come up a bunch more. Essentially, for a test where low values mean fluid responsiveness, area under the curve is the percent chance that a patient you're looking for, a fluid responder, will have a lower value than a non-responder. Um, for tests where patients that respond to fluids have a higher uh, value, such as stroke volume variation, then the uh, area under the curve is the chance that a patient you're looking for one of the fluid responders is going to have a higher value than a non-responder. So again, with CVP, there's a 56% chance that uh, a fluid responder will have a lower CVP than someone who doesn't respond to fluid. And in the more recent analysis in uh, a selected group of patients, those that we tend to think CVP is more valuable than those with really low CVPs, it's only a 57% chance. So, I don't think very, I mean, we, we all still use CVP is the funny thing. Uh, this data is out there and I think we all know it. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll say we're using it as part of a lot of different variables and it's appropriate because it's one piece of information among many. But it really has very little predictive value whatsoever as far as, you know, uh, answering the specific question will my patient respond to fluids? Might answer other questions, but this, this question specifically, CVP, you may as well just throw it out. And by the same token, wedge. Wedge is uh, similarly, similarly kind of fraught because it's not actually an assessment of fluid responsiveness. And it's not even really an assessment of preload. Wedge is attractive compared to CVP because it isolates the left ventricle and we want to optimize left ventricular preload to increase increased stroke volume and increased cardiac output. But uh, it's still subject to the same kind of physiologic limitations where that's the pressure that returning blood pushes against. So uh, there were a couple of big studies where CVP performs no, or excuse me, Wedge performs, uh, actually had zero correlation with uh, fluid responsiveness. Um, so, in response to this growing body of evidence, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign has advocated that we assess fluid responsiveness on the basis of these dynamic tools, many of which you're familiar with. Um, so, CVP and wedge uh, and a couple other variables that we sometimes use are static predictors of fluid responsiveness. Um, the Surviving Sepsis Campaign basis recommendation, I think in large part on this meta-analysis and the literature that went into it showing that goal-directed therapy using 
dynamic uh, predictors of fluid responsiveness uh, has a results in a risk ratio of 60 percent uh, for death, a relative risk ratio. Um, also less time on the vent, less time in the ICU, and this is understandably related to giving fluid to people that need it and uh, withholding fluid from people that aren't going to benefit from it. Um, so again, the static variables we discussed, CVP, wedge, um, these are kind of readily available static variables, static in that it's a single point in time. When you talk about somebody's CVP, you say the CVP was 4. You don't say the CVP was 4 and I did some maneuver and it became 10, or the patient breathed in and it became 6. It's a static variable because you just talk about the one number. Um, these are IVC diameter on ultrasound, not IVC collapsibility, but IVC diameter is also a static variable. Uh, left ventricular and diastolic area index and esophageal, flow, esophageal Doppler flow time, these are also static indices. Now, you'll notice we're talking about, you know, IVC ultrasound and esophageal Doppler or um, transthoracic echo, and these tool, those, each of those are, are tools that we use to estimate volume responsiveness, but they, they're used to develop a, a number, and that number might be either a static or a dynamic variable. So I think it's important when you talk about IVC ultrasound as a predictor of fluid responsiveness, that's, that's a tool you're using, it's not a test in and of itself. So to make it a dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness, you take your IVC ultrasound, or actually IVC ultrasound is a, a little bit different, but say you take, you take a transthoracic echo, use it to estimate cardiac output, then you make some change in preload, and you see what happens to the, the cardiac output afterwards. Um, so these, these are the techniques um, that we're going to talk about now. These are the ones that result in this 40% relative risk reduction in mortality that the, sur that the surviving sepsis campaign says we should be using. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of them. Um, as I said, you can define it as a surrogate of cardiac output before and after some change in preload, a temporary change in preload. So there's lots of different surrogates of cardiac output you could use. Thermal dilution or FIC being the gold standard. Um, but there's a lot of other ones, and we're going to talk about some of them. There's also a fair bit of literature on dynamic assessments of fluid responsiveness that don't actually don't actually measure some surrogate of cardiac output. That would be your IVC ultrasound, or actually uh, what's called a CVP index. Um, so these are assessments of <coughs> fluid, res or excuse me, these are assessments of preload, fraught as they are for the reasons we discussed, um, that you look at in the course of respiration. And we'll talk about how respiration is um, a temporary modification in preload uh, of exactly the sort we're looking for. Um, though with some limitations. So, again, because I think people only remember maybe one, two, three points from any given talk, this is this definition of dynamic assessments of fluid responsiveness, this I want to clarify. Uh, so, you take your measure of cardiac output, you do essentially an experiment where you change preload temporarily, whether that's through an end expiratory hold, through a tiny fluid bolus, through the patient's spontaneous respirations, through the respirations that are the positive pressure respirations that are happening on the ventilator, and then you see how your measure of cardiac output changes afterwards. Um, so I emphasize that because I want to make sure we don't talk about IVC ultrasound as a predictor of fluid responsiveness or um, pulse pressure variation, Vigileo as a predictor of fluid responsiveness. Those are um, the pulse pressure is a surrogate of cardiac output and. Uh, your estimate, your estimate of someone's fluid responsiveness is going to be limited by both how accurate and really primarily by how accurate your assessment of someone's cardiac output is and then how effectively you modified their preload in a predictable way. So IVC ultrasound I think is one of the techniques that we're most comfortable with. Um, and IVC diameter, I, so we'll talk briefly about that. IVC diameter is um, very similar to CVP. It's a single number, 
and you can, you know, you say it's less than 1.9, less than 2, and so therefore I think the patient's fluid responsive. But these static uh, variables, for reasons, well, these static variables have not borne out that well. Um, conversely, changes in the IVC diameter in response to positive pressure ventilation or spontaneous respiration, that's a dynamic variable. Um, so it's, it's kind of confusing because it's not an experiment in the same sense as a measuring cardiac output and then doing a fluid challenge and then remeasuring it. Um, the patient's own respirations or the ventilator's respirations are what's changing your preload. So in order to do uh, IVC ultrasound, you gotta be able to see the IVC um, and then you have to have the patient either spontaneously breathing or with positive pressure ventilation. So there's a big meta-analysis in 2014 here um, where they kind of summarize the existing data on IVC ultrasound. Uh, it's a lot better in patients that are on the vent and this is understandable because in a patient who's not spontaneously breathing and is vented, you know exactly, you're, you're getting a reliable temporary increase in preload with every positive pressure breath. Versus a patient sitting in the emergency department breathing on their own, you put a probe on their belly, they take a breath in, they breathe out, they take the next breath in, maybe you push the probe a little harder and they take a big breath or they take a small breath, and there's variation there that, uh, that you can't control for. So it's not surprising that spontaneous inspiration is less effective than controlled respiration, uh, positive pressure ventilation. So recalling our uh, introduction of the area under the curve, um, the area under the curve in this meta-analysis, there were actually uh, four studies that they included looking at um, positive pressure ventilation. And the area under the curve for three of those was 0 0.89, 0 0.90, 0 0.91 really excellent. So that shows 90% of the time um, a uh, IVC, excuse me, IVC collapsibility index um, is going to be, excuse me, 90% of the time a patient with a, uh, a fluid responsive patient will have a higher IVC collapsibility index than a non-fluid responsive patient. Um, or to put it in somewhat simpler terms, on average uh, of the four trials there, it was 81% sensitive for picking up fluid responders and 87% specific. In spontaneously breathing patients, uh, the numbers are a lot lower, as you can see. Um, so I didn't actually include it here, but the odds ratios um, were 30 invented patients and 13 in spontaneously breathing patients. Um, so to get into one of those studies in a little bit more detail, um, well, excuse me, this is a different meta-analysis that I, I'm not actually going to present the data from um, because they included a lot of different uh, techniques, not just collapsibility index. And when people talk about IVC ultrasound, I think the strength is the collapsibility index rather than a static measurement because the static measurement is essentially the same as a CVP. Um, so... Uh, collapsibility index, that's the uh, uh, diameter during positive pressure, uh, positive pressure ventilation, uh, excuse me, it's the change in diameter over the total diameter. So a 40% variation uh, was used as the cutoff in this, one of the stronger studies included in that meta-analysis. These folks, they took uh, um, 40 patients who are hypotensive, um, 40 spontaneously breathing patients. This is one of the stronger ones from the spontaneously breathing population. Um, and as you can see, it was 80% sensitive, 70% 70 70 specific. So you're going to miss 20% of the patients that need the bolus, and you're going to give 30% of the patients that don't need a bolus one anyway. Um, but uh, it's difficult in spontaneously breathing patients. This may be the best the best tool we've got. So when I was talking about how IVC ultrasound itself is not uh, a test of volume responsiveness, similarly passive leg raise is not a test of volume responsiveness. IVC ultrasound or um, stroke volume, those are measures of cardiac output or preload uh, 
and passive lag rays is a technique to modify preload. So when you hear about data for passive leg rays, I think it's important to look at not just the technique they use to modify preload, but also the techniques they use to measure cardiac output. Um, since I think the limitations come in large part directly from the limitations in our techniques for uh, monitoring cardiac output. Um, so again, you can imagine a patient with the, uh, um, on the Frank Starling curve somewhere, you don't know where, and by doing a passive leg raise, you temporarily translocate a bunch of volume from their leg veins into the central circulation, and you move them along this curve. And so if they're on a steep part of the curve, then you're gonna observe a measurable difference in a measurable increase in cardiac output. If they're on a relatively flat part of the curve, then it's gonna be a small, non-significant change in cardiac output. So in order to do the test, you need to have some continuous measure of cardiac output or stroke volume. Um, frequently, uh, in a lot of the studies that's out there, this has been uh, stroke volume or um, transthoracic echo in this case. I think this is a particularly strong one because using the, because it's got an effective measure of cardiac output. Um, you can do a LV outflow track Doppler where look at the, the cross-sectional area of the LV outflow and you measure the velocity across it. And so this is a, it's a well-validated technique for um, measuring cardiac output. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly then, because you have a predictable modification in a patient's preload and then a well-validated measure of cardiac output, um, it performed really well. Um, as you can see, Using a cutoff for uh, um, a 12% increase in stroke volume, 12.5% increase in stroke volume observed during a passive leg raise, they had a 77% sensitivity and 100% specificity for predicting volume responsiveness, which again is defined as a 15% increase in cardiac output after a, a bolus. So use a kind of lower cutoff than what you're actually going for because you're not you're only giving the amount of blood that's in somebody's legs instead of uh, a full bolus or a five uh, a 500 cc bolus. They're usually small boluses. So this was in spontaneously breathing patients, um, and I think based on uh, based on the evidence that th that's out there, this is your strongest test for a non-intubated patient. Um, because instead of relying on a person's respirations, which are not always uniform, um, you're doing a relatively predictable temporary change in their preload by emptying their legs into their central circulation. And then you can measure that cardiac output by whatever means you have available. So transthoracic echo, I think that's, you know, of more interest to some of us than others as far as doing that every day on every single patient versus... Uh, um, I guess, it, as I said, whatever tool you have available. And the more, more accurate your tool is, the more uh, accurate your test is gonna be. So it performed even better in intubated patients. Um, this is, um, again, I'd say kind of unsurprising because there's less uncontrolled variables. Um, these guys, they took uh, 71 intubated patients. They used esophageal Doppler and again, just to, to clarify, when you talk about passive leg rays, um, a lot of the literature is using these techniques that we don't necessarily, we're not necessarily using. So again, passive leg rays is not a technique for measuring fluid responsiveness. It's a way to temporarily modify preload. You can incorporate into lots of different tools for measuring preload responsiveness. Um, so um, using a esophageal Doppler and 10% uh, cutoff in aortic blood flow is the cutoff. They had a sensitivity of 97% and a specificity of 94%. Um, they, in this same cohort, they calculated stroke volume variation um, and found it performed similarly. So in those patients for whom you don't have a Doppler, but they are intubated and um, meeting the other requirements for stroke volume variation that we're gonna talk about in just a second, that performs just as well. So, brief refresher, you guys know what an esophageal Doppler is. Um, uh, they are available here. Um, 
I haven't been in the unit in a while, so I haven't used one in a while. I'm not sure how commonly you guys are using them. Um, one thing to be wary of, as far as looking at the literature for um, fluid responsiveness and esophageal Doppler, older studies used uh, the corrected flow time, um, which is not uh, which is not a dynamic measurement. It doesn't change in response. They you don't measure it before and after uh, respiration or during respiration, so it's um, kind of gone by the wayside and. Um, performs, uh, does not perform as well as stroke volume variation as assessed by esophageal Doppler. Um, so uh, there's actually a fair bit of liter literature on esophageal Doppler. Um, again, with excellent performance, an area under the curve of uh, 0.9 um, in mechanically ventilated anesthetized surgical patients. So, let me see, what did I do, pulse pressure variation there. So, pos uh, pulse pressure variation or stroke volume variation, these are both surrogates for cardiac output, uh, and both are pretty well validated. Um, I'm personally more accustomed to using stroke volume variation. We have the vigilator you just put in your R-line, your central line, you hook it up to your innovated patient, and it gives you a number you can use. Um, but... Uh, the Vigileo is not universally available. It's an expensive proprietary tool, and it's actually possible to use other surrogates of cardiac output. Instead of stroke volume, you can just look at the pulse pressure or even the systolic blood pressure, um, and these have all been validated. Um, for instance, there's this study here um, looking at uh, respiratory variation in uh, pulse pressure um, where you can literally print off your art line strip and measure it and uh, if you're in some resource limited setting, I think this is probably how I'd be, uh, I'd, I would be tempted to try to predict fluid responsiveness using this method. Um, so, um, again, kind of the same concept, your pulse pressure, your uh, stroke volume variation, these are going to be greatest when your patient is on the steep part of a Frank Starling curve, whichever curve uh, you know applies to your specific patient, whichever point on that curve they're at. So, um, when we talk about uh, stroke volume variation in a mechanically ventilated patient, you're using a temporary change in preload from the positive inspiratory pressure to move the patient along the, uh, the Frank Starling curve, um, and they uh, cyclically move back and forth, and so the the steeper that curve is, the greater the change in their cardiac output will, will be with each respiratory cycle, and um, the higher their stroke volume variation will be. So if they're on a flat part of the curve, they're going to they're have a low pulse pressure variation or a low stroke volume variation, um, and you can use that to predict that they are unlikely to be fluid responsive. So pulse pressure variation, as I was saying, a lot simpler than stroke volume variation and um, performed excellently in this study by uh, these, this French group. Uh, so they had 40 septic patients. They were all mechanically ventilated. It's suspiciously perfect, their uh, uh, results. Um, and uh, they also measured um, systolic blood pressure variation, um, which was only marginally worse than pulse pressure variation. So stroke volume variation kind of alluded to earlier. Um, instead of just looking at uh, what's a person's pulse pressure or their blood pressure uh, during temporary changes in preload, you can look at uh, the Vigileo looks at the entire um, uh, pulse contour and calculates kind of the area under that curve, which is the, uh, like the integral of that curve is the, the blood flow. Um, so you're going to get a more accurate uh, measurement of cardiac output, um, and um, not surprisingly, oh darn, uh, not surprisingly, on average, kind of better, uh, better performance. So the the um, excuse me, the cutoff value for stroke volume variation. 
um, excuse me, <laughs> I guess uh, in innovative patients to look at the stroke volume variation need to have a, um, they need to be on, po uh, they need to be on positive pressure, they need to have the same positive pressure with each breath. They can't be taking negative breaths to trigger the ventilator because then the, the change in their preload will reflect a combination of the decreased intrathoracic pressure that they initiated the ventilator with and then the positive intrathoracic pressure from the, the positive pressure from the ventilator. Um, so you need to have a, an adequately sedated patient or a paralyzed patient or a sufficiently high set respiratory rate that there's no spontaneous respiratory effort on the part of the patient. Um, and then that uh, positive pressure ventilation has to be uh, large enough, it has to be enough pressure to move a significant amount of blood. So uh, the recommendations are um, to increase the, the set tidal volume to 8 to 10 cc's per kilo um, and to make sure the patient's not taking any spontaneous breaths. So you can increase the rate or you can paralyze them or sedate them. Um, so it, uh, as I said, there's a lot of papers out there and I'm not gonna try to summarize all the different literature uh, on these different techniques. Um, but suffice to say that if you don't have a contraindication to using stroke volume variation, um, it performs excellently. Um, however, most patients in the ICU do have some contraindication. Uh, you have to have, as I said, the, the specific ventilator settings. The patient has to be in a regular rhythm. And just those two requirements without any of the other drawbacks of stroke volume variation are met in about 20% of ICU patients. So this one's kind of fun um, just to kind of wrap up because, as I said, you can use lots of different surrogates at cardiac output and some of them are a lot cheaper and more readily available than uh, the Vigileo monitor. There's been some research into just looking at the amplitude of the pulse ox waveform. And in patients who aren't septic, uh, it actually performed really well. Patients who are on pressors, who are vasoconstricted, who are septic, uh, it's understandably not gonna work. Anything that limits your estimate of the patient's cardiac output, that limits the accuracy of your estimate of the patient's cardiac output, you know, we know the pulse ox is not very accurate in certain contexts. Anything that limits that is going to decrease the effectiveness of your test. So in patients where you have a great pulse ox waveform, um, you can use respiratory variation in the amplitude of the pulse ox waveform to predict fluid responsiveness. Um, with again, as I said, excellent outcomes, surprisingly good outcomes of the area under the curve of 0.9 and 90% sensitivity. Um, so I think I've already kind of driven this point home enough times, but this is, this is what I wanna, this is my one learning point for the lecture, which is um, your estimates of fluid responsiveness are gonna be based, uh, they're gonna be as accurate as your measurement of cardiac output and how well you controlled your temporary change in preload. Um, so at this point, I kind of open it up to discussion and uh, welcome any questions you have. Thank you for your patience and thank you for the opportunity. Dr. Moore. Well, so there's a lot of talk about stroke volume, but has that ever been the actual measure in a randomized study to show that, you know, by improving stroke outcome, we improve, like, outcomes in, in septic patients or patients with shock? Um, so... The answer is no, but... Yeah. Uh, I was going to... I think, uh, sorry, Dr. Gio. No, I was, I was going to go looking for one of the studies in this meta-analysis. I thought there was one, but I'll take your word for it. No, it, 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 it becomes a circular question, though, Steve, right? Yeah. We give fluid because we believe it's good because it increases stroke volume. So if you don't believe increasing stroke volume is good, what's good? Well, so that's the question is, are we, what, what's the goal we're really aiming at here? And did, are we, is this a true surrogate we want to look at, or is there a bigger picture? Because, I mean, we look at the, you know, we're using the Frank Starling curve, and we want to push them up on the Frank Starling curve. The Frank Starling curve doesn't take into account the entire right side of the
something to do, is it truly to increase the stroke volume? Is there another effect that we're seeing? I mean, you know, a lot of these models took out the idea of, you know, one volume, one water, uh, like as an extra bad for space. I mean, that's, I just, you know, I think there's this kind of a more complex question here once you start looking at all this stuff, so. Actually, I really think some of the questions are really simple. And it's interesting that some of the most simple research hasn't really been done. <coughs> so to me, there, we've been using dynamic measurements of these things for a long time. The, the simplest dynamic measure is to measure somebody's blood pressure and give a fluid challenge and measure what happens to their blood pressure after the fluid challenge. That's, that's a dynamic measure, too. And it'd be interesting to hear about a meta-analysis that look for studies that instead of comparing static versus dynamic variables, that compared to some of the, that compared some of the dynamic variables that you've talked about, which I think are good things, the vigil AO or the esophageal Doppler, compared that to simply looking at blood pressure and its response to fluid um, challenges. Because that's a simple, for me, that's the control group, right? Because I can do that in people who have that for years. So, how does using those newer measurements compare with using something that's very traditional? And you could develop a, a study where you look at your outcome measure, whether it's like the span the ICU or recovery from sepsis or mortality. But the standard dynamic measurement is something we've been using for a long time. And it's interesting that finding a study that compares these modern measurements with something really simple that we've been doing forever a very hard time. Well, and I was thinking more of like, you know, let's look at our, our surrogates of like, you know, really what we want is we want endorphin perfusion. We look at things like lactate, we look at things like mixed bean and sac, you know, as a, a, for oxygen extraction. Have we ever compared these increasing stroke volume to, to does this really down the road actually cause this lactate clearance? And I, I don't know I, that I haven't seen the literature, and that's why I would wonder if we, you know, if we look at those two and what if we didn't find that correlation there, have we just been aiming at the wrong part of it? We not really know that this stroke volume is really what's driving this end organ confusion, and it's actually just reloading up the system with fluid, you know. So I guess that was kind of why I uh, decided to focus so much on this. Just in my mind, the question was not that complicated. Why we give fluids, you know, the great majority of the time, it's because the person's under perfusing, and we think that we can increase their cardiac output and, and improve their you know, their perfusion with additional fluid. Um, so I think your point that you can assess that improvement in perfusion with simpler measures such as blood pressure has been borne out in the literature where, you know, just looking at systolic blood pressure, um, I didn't actually show that study here, but not just pulse pressure, but also systolic blood pressure in response to a mini fluid challenge or uh, expiratory hold or um, the inspiratory cycle on the ventilator uh, when other when other confounders are controlled for, does have excellent predictive value. Uh, thank you again for your time. <laughs>